live now? Yeah, we are. We are good. Hello, everyone. Uh, to, uh, the, in, well, everyone in attendance wanted the first APPG on race and community for this year. Um, this is my first meeting as chair of the group, and today we're going to be looking at the issue of race and elections. Um, so <clears throat> what's brought us here today? In the 2019 general election, almost half, 47, 47% of the black and ethnic minority electorate did not cast a vote. So in this session, we're going to discuss uh, with a group of distinguished panelists, uh, political partic participation in black and ethnic minority communities and the impact voter ID enforcement could have on it. Now, uh, this government recently announced its intentions to bring the electoral integrity bill to parliament this spring. And the bill will introduce ID checks at polling stations by 2023 to prevent, as they say, the potential for voter fraud. Now, in the US, where there is uh, lots of experience with voter ID, and I, I believe they call it voter suppression, um, they've been at the front line uh, of effort to combat such voter uh, suppression under Donald Trump and his allies. And they say the ID laws proposed in the UK will likely disproportionately affect people from poorer and more marginalized communities, within which black and ethnic minority people are disproportionately overrepresented. Now, the American Civil Liberties Union, the Southern Poverty Law Center and Commons Cause said that while they did not campaign directly in the UK, it was a common principle that such laws without evidence of widespread election fraud had a harmful impact. Uh, the disenfranchisement of uh, black and ethnic minority, minority people is pretty clear and that the introduction of this legislation requiring the electorate to present a photo ID to vote is a discriminatory attack on that right to vote. It's an affront to democracy. Now, we know the black and ethnic minorities are going to be disproportionately affected. The government's own data shows that of the 11 million people in the UK who do not hold a form of photo identification, they are disproportionately of a black or ethnic minority background and are largely constituted in the multiracial working class. And these people are already disproportionately disenfranchised with respect to voter turnout and registration in the United Kingdom, there are disparities in electoral participation along the lines of race. So we know in the 2019 general election, almost half, 47% of the black and ethnic minority uh, electorate did not cast a vote. So we must see the introduction of voter to ID for what it is, I believe, a naked attempt to import a US style voter suppression. Uh, what else could it be? Uh, when there is no evidence that voter fraud is a widespread problem in the United Kingdom. Now, according to the Electoral Commission, there was only one single instance of voter impersonation in the 2019 general election that would have been prevented with voter ID. So I guess we now need to ask ourselves, well, how do we increase turnout? How do we deepen our democracy? Um, if the government cared about strengthening democracy in the UK, they should start by immediately halting their plans to implement mandatory ID checks at polling stations. They could also introduce automatic voter registration of all British citizens um, uh, in the British Isles and abroad once they reached 18 years of age. Um, they might want to try introducing bank holidays for general elections to try and encourage uh, higher turnout. But ultimately, I think we need to go further in deepening and extending our democracy so that everyone cannot just participate but have real power over the decisions that affect their life and their communities. And that has to start with making every vote count. I'm a big advocate uh, for proportional representation. And we know that under the current first past the post voting system, votes are not counted equally. First past the post means parties can win 100% of the power with support from only a minority of the electorate. In the 2019 general election, we know the Conservatives won 56% of the seats in the House of Commons with less than 44% of the vote. And it, it took only 38,000 votes on average to elect each Conservative MP, compared with, for example, 50,000 votes for Labour MPs and 800,000 votes for the one solitary Green MP. But democracy doesn't start or finish at the ballot box. The political system we have now is closer, as a former Conservative Lord Chancellor, Lord Helsham, called it, to an elective dictatorship, one which I would argue has democratic features stapled on rather than built into the foundations. The UK does not have a democratic constitution. Our current political settlement privileges parliament, not the public. And the various crises facing our society, climate, ecological, technological, spiraling inequality, are part of the so-called crisis of democracy. Uh, and I think ultimately, uh, what the government are proposing does nothing to try 
to deal with that. So I'm now going to uh, introduce our guests. Um, and uh, we hope today that uh, what I'll do is I'll briefly go through um, each guest. I'm just about to try and find the bios which have disappeared from my screen. Give me a second. Um, uh, let's have a look here. So, okay, so I will very quickly go through each uh, individual who will be speaking today and they'll each have five minutes after I've introduced them to kind of go through the issues and then we'll open up to uh, a question and answer. So my first guest will be Kat Smith, the Shadow Minister. Is Kat here yet? Can we check? Is, I can't see her on my screen. Are you here, Kat? Can you wave your hand? I'm here. You are. I can't see. Oh, yeah, there you are. I didn't see you. Sorry, you're tucked down there. So our first guest is Kat Smith, uh, Shadow Minister, old comrade of mine, old friend. Um, and she uh, works on the front bench of the Labour Party, uh, Shadow in the Cabinet Office, and is the Shadow Minister for Young People and Voter Engagement. Next up, we'll be speaking to Patricia Stapleton, who is a policy manager at the Traveller Movement. If you just like to wiggle your hand, Patricia, that's you there. Um, we also have Mar Maurice McLeod, Chief Executive of Race on the Agenda. Maurice, if you re thank you. Uh, Josiah Mortimer, Communications Manager at the Electoral Reform Society. Uh, Kirsten Oswald, Shadow SMP Spokesperson on Equalities. And Jeremy Crook, someone I've known for a long time now, uh, Chief Executive of the Black Training and Enterprise Group. So if we go now first to Kat Smith, Kat, if you just give us five minutes to kind of go over uh, the issues that have been raised here today, this morning by myself, and just give us a bit of a perspective from the Labour front bench position on this. Thanks so much, Clive. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that the thing you said about having uh, polling days on bank holidays is certainly something we should look at. I mean, everything to do with polling day it's so outdated, you know, the idea of why do you vote on a Thursday, why the hours, the hours they are, why is it so, so much like not changed in hundreds of years, there are so many opportunities that we could take to actually modernize our democracy to throw open the doors and encourage people to vote, and that is certainly something that is it's something that drives me and it's why I really enjoy uh, doing this front bench brief for, for the Labour Party. Uh, and it's great to be able to take part um, in this session to talk about the barriers facing particularly Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities when it comes to accessing democracy in the UK. And as you said, Clive, you know, um, they're already less likely to be registered to vote, the, the white counterparts. Um, this is so concerning when you look at the impact that's going to have on democracy, because democracy is only as strong as when lots of people take part in it. You know, when you see voter turnout drop off, that actually damages democracy. We should be encouraging people to vote, uh, not putting barriers up in place. And in an absolute nutshell, if I had to down to one sentence, uh, that is where I'm coming up all of this about, you know, what we're seeing now is um, centuries of democratic practice in this country could be about to change with the adoption of one of the most backward and suppressive aspects of US uh, voting law. Ironically, of course, at a time that President Biden is actually rowing back from a lot of this stuff, our government is heading um, absolutely enthusiastically um, for it. And we know from the US um, that requiring photo ID to vote disproportionately uh, suppresses the vote from Black, Asian and ethnic minority voters. And here in the UK, uh, as we saw with the Windrush scandal, some communities do struggle to provide official documentation or identification, and that can have uh, severe consequences, um, as it did with Windrush, and would have severe consequences, I believe, if it was required to cast the vote at an election. Um, but it's not just the black community who are going to be negatively affected by this legislation. And I'm really glad that uh, Patricia is going to be speaking uh, later um, about the impact of voter ID on other ethnic minority groups, uh, such as the Gypsy Roma Traveller community. Um, there are still so many hugely unanswered questions from the government when it comes to this. The implication is that you will need a voter card driving license or passport. We just don't know whether or not a, that has to be a UK passport or whether or not an Irish passport would be acceptable. That's obviously an issue that would disproportionately affect the Gypsy Roma Traveller community, but not exclusively that community. For instance, uh, my own father holds an Irish passport, but not a UK passport and doesn't have a photo card driving license. Um, so, so we can see you know, how that would impact so many different groups of people. And I'm conscious, Clive, that you've given me five minutes, so I'm gonna try and rattle through about the two main arguments that are used by the government to justify 
this change and why it's complete fish. So number one is the issue of uh, voter fraud. Um, so the government's main justification for requiring ID to vote turns on the argument that the policy will tackle voter fraud. Uh, however, there is little evidence to suggest that personation of policies is a widespread problem in Britain. Um, in 2017, 44 million votes cast, 28 allegations, not proved, of um, personation of polling stations, and that actually resulted in just one conviction. In 2019, a year with a high turnout general election, there was just one conviction of personation. You know, the chances of being struck by lightning are three times higher than this. So it is very much a sledgehammer to crack a nut. And we've seen anti-racism groups like Hope Not Hate summing it up as uh, mandatory voter ID is a cure that is worse than the sickness. Uh, so that's the first um, issue, it just doesn't stack up. Uh, the second argument that ministers repeatedly claim is that evidence shows that mandatory voter ID has no impact on any particular demographic group. Again, it doesn't hold water. Uh, the Electoral Commission openly admit that the government's pilots didn't even collect any data about the numbers of black, Asian or minority ethnic voters uh, able to vote or unable to vote. Um, and of course, the pilots were carried out in areas with very low diversity. Uh, in addition, um, the Labour Party um, and my team have uh, been uh, having really quite a lot of fun with freedom of information requests. And we found that not one of the government departments hold any data on possession of ID by ethnicity. So whilst the government has stated repeatedly on record that evidence concludes that voter ID has no impact on any particular demographic group, the evidence doesn't actually exist. Um, and ministers have uh, so far uh, failed to clarify that inconsistency. So when it comes to improving the integrity of our democracy, the government should be doing everything it can to get more people to vote, you know, not putting up barriers. Um, Labour will continue to fight this policy and when the uh, bills published in the early summer say, uh, we'll continue that fight there. So uh, please do um, get in touch if you're going to pick up any of these issues with me or my team after the event. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing from uh, the other brilliant organisations that I do to speak uh, this morning and look forward to questions. Thanks so much, Kat. And don't worry about going over. There's a little bit of fat in, in the timing because uh, I, I spoke for less than I should have, which is a first for me. Um, I didn't think people wanted to hear me drone on too much. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, in those introductory comments, uh, it's very appreciated. Um, Patricia Stapleton, um, if you'd like to come next. Patricia is a policy manager with the national charity, The Traveller Movement. Uh, and Patricia, um, if you'd like to give us five minutes, kind of setting the scene, if you would. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. I'll do my best to stay within the five minutes. Um, yes, I'm Patricia. I work for the Traveller Movement. We're a national charity that works uh, to promote the rights of ethnic gypsies, Roma and travellers in the UK. Uh, we're primarily a policy and campaigning charity, although we do at the moment have, some se have several direct support projects that you're on catch up tuition. Um, this bill is of particular importance to us uh, because gypsies, Roma and travellers, we believe, are not uh, are underrepresented. In politics, and we feel that we that we we strongly believe it's hard to prove because there isn't um, good idea, there isn't good research on this. We strongly believe that many gypsies and travellers do not vote; they don't turn out to vote. Um, from our own kind of uh, Facebook polls, we know many aren't registered to vote. Um, this is largely due to the historical kind of treatment of gypsies and travellers, and current to this day treatment by politicians of gypsies and travellers. So it isn't uncommon to hear parliamentarians speak really negatively and discriminatorily in the chamber about gypsies and travellers, referring to them as a problem, um, sometimes using language like as a disease, really, really deeply problematic language. Very hard to challenge these things. We do challenge quite frequently, but very hard to call it out because of things like parliamentary privilege. This also happens at the local level. We find in the run to elections in particular, um, a lot of electoral candidates will, you know, will kind of curry favour with locals by saying, you know, we'll stop the traveller site from being built, things like that. Um, as a result of this kind of rhetoric, we're very keen for gyps and travellers to register to vote. Um, in 2015, we launched Operation Traveller Vote, uh, largely building on the success of Operation Black Vote. Um, and that was primarily aimed at gyps and travellers, asking them to register to vote, getting them interested in politics, explaining why it was for them um, and how they could challenge this kind of stuff. So we would produce manifestos, uh, do hostings, produce materials, encourage people to question their electoral candidates if they did come to their doorstep or to their site. 
Um, I don't know if you know this, but many gypsum travellers don't live on sites. About 75 to 78% live in bricks and mortar accommodation. So the perception that most gypsum travellers live on sites is actually incorrect. Um, so yeah, just something to put out there. Um, we're very happy to speak about this issue in particular because, as I just mentioned, people are underrepresented, gypsum travellers are underrepresented in politics. They're poorly served by politicians. Um, as a result, we are this year starting research on the voter ID bill and the potential impact that it'll have on these communities. At the moment, we are doing desk research and we're going to shortly publish a survey, actually. We've been working quite closely with Kat and Kate, who've been super helpful around, you know, uh trying to find out basically you know what kind of id gypsum travelers have <clears throat> will they vote what's their intention what's their perception of voting of politicians that kind of stuff it hasn't been done before it should, it should be quite interesting um we're also unsure ourselves but we should be asking people because we yet to, we don't know yet you know what type of what photo id will be required it's quite problematic actually many um irish travelers are they're second generation irish they don't actually have a british passport many are not naturalized um there's lots of reasons for that um a sense of identity, a sense of belonging, um, just haven't ha haven't needed to, you know, the kind of practical reasons. Um, this was an issue for us around the time of the, just after the Brexit referendum, we were kind of concerned about Irish citizen rights. So we've done quite a bit of research around that too, around protecting those rights. <clears throat> um, but in addition to that, we've had, we've done some very minor kind of Facebook polls. I'm glad Kat mentioned her FOIs because um, based on our polls. <clears throat> I know the government don't hold this, uh, don't hold ethnicity data on who owns passports and owns the driver's license. But our own kind of polls show that up to 27% of different travellers don't have photo ID. And they're mostly older travellers. Um, most younger travellers will have a driver's license, but older travellers may not. Um, and I know if I speak to my colleagues <clears throat> and from the research we've done ourselves, the primary kind of research is that people are very disenfranchised by voting. And we do feel that this would be an additional barrier you know, it just entirely to, to voting, the whole process is highly problematic. Um, once our research is, is finished, we'll be publishing it with a view to doing some serious lobbying. So we'll be very happy to work with everyone here as well. So very happy to run Running Meet um, with other groups, um, with with Kat and with her team as well. We think it's really important that we push back on this. It's really unnecessary. Yeah. We know ourselves that it is, you know, um, it's something that's really really causes us great concern as an organization because people gypsum travelers were so poorly served by poli by politics that I, I just we don't see the value in this at all there is no case if we're voter fraud in this country it's really unfortunate it's come to this so yeah we're very keen to kind of push ahead and work with people here as well so that's actually me down that's, in the chat. that's really good patricia you come in on time so thank you so <laughs> much for that um and also as well i think you know we also share those concerns it's i think it's one of the reasons why we put it as uh, the first issue for us to discuss as an APPG, because clearly time isn't on our side. This is legislation that's on its way, and it is, I think, something for us all to be really concerned about. Um, before I introduce the next speaker, can I just, I can see some uh, of those who are, are joining us today have already worked out the Q&A function. It's a standard drill. If you look down on the bottom of your screens, you'll see a series of options, participant, chat, share screen, record, raise hand and Q&A. Now, if you would like to ask a question of the panelists in the Q&A section, if you type your question in there, there's a good chance or a chance that we could pick that up and, and run with that and, and ask our, our panelists. So please use that function to ask questions, not the chat because they won't get picked up, although you can use the chat for other things. Um, so on to our next speaker, Maurice McLeod, who's the chief executive uh, of race on the agenda. He's a lifelong anti-racist campaigner. Maurice, over to you for your five minutes. Thank you, Maurice. All right, th thank you, Clive, and hello, hello everyone. Um, look, our, our democracy's got a problem. Um, as well as as well as running Rota, I'm a local councillor, and before the pandemic, uh, I spent a lot of time sort of knocking on doors and asking people to vote for my party's candidate. And and the responses were were really disappointingly predictable. Um, why should I vote? What difference does it make that there's there's a large chunk of our society uh, for whom politics is something that happens to them rather than something that they engage with. Laws sort of come down from on high and have sort of massive impacts on their lives, but, but those making the laws are, are feel sort of remote and, and unaccountable. Um, we're supposed to live under a social contract where we obey the laws and the norms and society provides access to our basic needs and, and a platform to grow and find happiness. Um, 
but if those laws and norms mean our families don't actually get access to those basic needs and if the platforms for growth are are so lopsided that that they become like a cliff face rather than a, a, a playing field uh, our only fallback is is the promise of being able to to replace the lawmakers with new ones um, every few years we we all get the opportunity to to replace our elected representatives and choose someone who we prefer um, I, I actually think it's a poor shadow of, of, a, of a real democracy, but it's, it's sort of the only version we've got at the moment. Um, the people who get the worst deal under the social contract are the very people that it's most important we encourage to vote in order to force those making our laws pay attention to their needs. Um, that's why the government's proposed electoral integrity bill is is so concerning uh, the elect it's 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 a solution that's that's looking for a problem um as as has been said by clive and, and everyone else there was only one case one case of of voter impersonation in the 2019 election that would have been prevented by by voter id that's out of 32 million votes um a, a, a sort of and, and as has been said, a much bigger problem for our democracy is the one is the one in three people who don't vote at all. Um, that that's not even to mention the people who aren't registered. Um, I'd argue this is where our energy should be focused. Um, we need to create politics that everyone feels part of, but instead it seems we're looking for more ways of excluding people. Um, for many on the, on on this call, um, the idea of providing photo ID when voting must seem like a non-issue. Um, we have our driving licenses in our wallets and our passports sort of waiting at home for, for whenever we can make a, a foreign trip. But um, as has been said, 11 million people in the UK, um, um, that's more than one in five of the electorate don't have any form of photo ID. You don't have to be a statistical genius to work out that those who don't go on foreign holidays and don't drive cars are more likely to be amongst the poorest in Britain. The government's own data shows that while 76% of white people hold a full driving license, only 72% of Asian people, 69% of mixed ethnicity people, and 52% of black people do. And while ministers have promised free ID cards from local councils uh, on advanced request, um, this represents yet another bureaucratic barrier and, and will put many off voting. Um, there are already disparities uh, in voting in the UK. The last general election, uh, nearly half, 47% of black people didn't vote. The Electoral Commission found that 84% that, that, that 84 of white people are registered, but only 76% of Asian people, 75% of black people, and 69% of people from mixed backgrounds. The hostile immigration environment has created many reasons for migrants and uh, to be cautious when when it comes to engaging with the state and a quarter of eligible first generation migrants and a fifth of second generation migrants are not registered to vote it's concerning that the, the specter of voter fraud uh, is being used to justify these moves as it sounds eerily eerily similar to the narrative we've seen play out in the USA over the last couple of years, um, which culminated in, in the attack on the Capitol building on, in, in January. Uh, we've seen in recent years that if large portions of the public feel that society isn't working for them and that they have no real way of encouraging it to change, the results can be unpredictable. We need to make our democracy more inclusive. What, we, what can we do? Um, as has been said, auto, auto, automatic voter registration. All British citizens, home or abroad, once you reach the age of 18, are automatically registered. Um, bringing in a, a, a one-day holiday, a statutory holiday for voting, so that, so that people in precarious work don't have to negotiate with their bosses uh, in order to exercise their, their democratic rights. And, and of course, scrapping any idea of any idea of mandatory uh, voter ID at, at, at the polling stations. Um, our democracy only works if everyone can take part. Thank you, Thank you Maurice. Um, 
our democracy only works if everyone can take part. I think that kind of sums up in a sentence um, what this is about. Uh, some, some themes that you've brought out there, um, representative democracy versus participative democracy. Maybe that's something we can put out a little bit more later on. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, can I just say on, on the Q&As, I can see that Kat is getting stuck in. They're answering the questions there. So the rest of the panelists, once you've spoken, if or before you've spoken, if you'd like, if you see any questions where you've got a really good answer, feel free to kind of tap away. Um, Kat's obviously well-practiced and well-versed uh, in uh, online um, meetings now. Um, so our next speaker uh, is uh, Josiah Mortimer, who's the communication manager, communications manager at the Electoral Reform Society. Josh, if you'd like to give us five minutes and your take on this issue as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Clive, and uh, thanks to, to everyone else too. Um, I just want to start by saying I, I don't think this argument is about fraud in some ways. Um, I think, you know, as we've heard, impersonation numbers are vanishingly small, um, but I think the government actually wants this to be a debate about voter fraud. Um, much like saying, don't think of an elephant makes you actually think of an elephant. Talk about any fraud just makes people think about fraud. Um, and more cases, obviously, too many. Um, as we know, it would take shutting down democracy entirely to eliminate any risk of fraud. What is clear, I think, is that we're already facing this policy, as others have alluded to, on the basis of a deeply unequal political system. There are 9 million people missing from the electoral roll, which is a pressing national scandal. Um, we have a winner takes all voting system that often makes people feel it's not worth bothering voting at all. And we have a government that hints at abolishing our independent electoral watchdog while dark ads and dodgy donations are on the rise. So we need greater electoral integrity, absolutely. Uh, voter ID will definitely not secure it. And there are real problems about the government's priorities and indeed the motivations to this policy, I think. But it's also at its core about competing visions of democracy, about open versus closed. On the one hand, where voting is a social good and that it's something to be facilitated and encouraged, or on the other, where democracy is where you have to jump through a series of bureaucratic barriers to show that you care. And as I think the US experience has shown recently, once you build those barriers, they can keep getting bigger and bigger. I just want to talk a bit now about sort of how we frame this debate, because the US has been speaking to voters recently about their views on ID. I think what we're learning over time is that although stats about fraud don't win the debate necessarily, um, what voters do care about is the principle of fairness. Many people assume that everyone has ID, um, and when they're actually made aware that that's not the case, people know that this is a, a major problem um, and it's one that's currently invisible until we start talking about it. So I think we have to be clear that mandatory ID represents a threat to all of us, um, to our friends, our family, those we work with, um, that it essentially represents taking a crowbar to the already critical cracks in our democracy. And I think as well in talking about ID, it's also worth noting the potential for cross-party cooperation. Um, you know, the revelation that 35% of over 70s don't own a passport is a really important finding. Uh, I think Kat was working on that this week. Um, it's an important finding for conservatives too. And there are, I hope, conservatives who are able to stand up and challenge this. Um, you know, we've seen David Davis raising concerns about ID recently. I, I think it kind of makes sense. After all, this is a, a big brother policy. It's coming at a huge cost during a pandemic. And it's imposed on nations that do not want it. Not to mention the fact that £20 million pounds per election could pay for about 600 nurses a year. So instead, we're spending it turning polling staff into bouncers. Um, I think we also need personal stories of many of those who lack ID um, to start bringing this home to what it's about, which is ordinary people locked out of the ballot box. Just um, finishing on some, some next steps. Um, I think, as mentioned, it seems likely it's just going to be bundled up with some other changes to democracy, some of which might be positive to sweeten the pill. Um, I think if and when this legislation is proposed, we need to use all the levers we can to scrap or overhaul this legislation. Because um, there's really big questions that remain. It's um, particularly dangerous to leave a policy of so-called free ID, um, as Morris mentioned, in the hands of more than 300 councils, many of them of which are one-party states. Um, and we saw in Woking last week that councils sometimes are prepared to interpret legislation and guidelines in often deeply concerning ways and sometimes get away with it. I think as anyone who's trawled through council election results pages also knows, electoral offices vary hugely in terms of their resources and their standards. Um, there's another question as well, you know, will those who forget their ID be able to bring it later, as in some states? But I think the key one is, will it be genuinely free? Um, you know, we have to be clear that there are major costs of tracking or busing to council offices 
that are open for only two hours on a Wednesday morning. And that is examples that we have actually seen in the US. But I think today is showing, and um, you know, which we've seen over the past few years, that there is a really powerful coalition that's prepared to stand up to this legislation in the next few months. And um, at the ERS, we're really looking forward to working together to show the dangers of this, this legislation um, and present an alternative vision as well for expanding democracy instead of putting up walls. Thanks. Thank you very much, Josh, Josiah. I really appreciate that. And I think you made a really important point there, and it's one that I was going to touch on in my opening remarks, which is on how we frame this debate uh, and this legislation. So the voter integrity bill um, reminds me of the spare room subsidy. And obviously uh, it became known as bedroom tax. And it went to the point where even the conservatives were using it themselves. And I think, you know, the alternative for us would be the voter suppression bill. Um, I mean, in terms of calling this what it is, um, rather than, as you said, the elephant in the room, when you talk about fraud or integrity, those are the, that's the frame within which they want this debate to be conducted. And we have to say, no, that isn't the frame. The frame is uh, undermining our democracy and voter suppression. So um, I will bring in our next speaker. Our, our next speaker is Kirsten Oswald, the shadow SNP spokesperson on equalities. Kirsten, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Clive. It's been really interesting to hear all of these speeches so far. I'm really looking forward to the questions as well. I, I think that it's an issue really that should concern all of us. I think that we should all be uh, pausing for a uh, thought when we see what the, the government has planned. Successful democracy surely has to be conditional upon everyone participating and everyone's voices having an equal weight. So the fact that we're discussing this proposal at all I think is a serious cause for concern about the priorities and the thinking of the people that are bringing it forward. I think it's pretty impossible to see these plans as anything other than an exercise in cynical self-interest on the part of the current UK government. It's really telling that of all the pressing needs that could be their focus, this is the issue that they've decided um, needs their um, significant attention at the moment. Because being realistic, any rational assessment of the factors that undermine the integrity of governance in the UK would absolutely not see the introduction of polling station ID for voters as a priority action. What about the, the need for action on the abomination that is the House of Lords, the largest legislative chamber outside China and appointments to that place are only um, possible with heavy influence by relationships with members of the government and political donations. So you contrast that with the very small number, vanishingly small number of cases of fraud by people committing personation at a polling station. You would think that all things being equal, that um, the persistent corruption around access to the role of the legislator would be a much more damaging thing for democracy in the UK, and that issues like that would warrant action. And we've heard about this already. What about the need to reform the electoral system itself? That's stuck in the, the 19th century and produces majority governments on two fifths of all votes cast. So taking all of that into account and, and thinking about this, there is little evidence, really, I can't see the evidence at all, that voter fraud influences election results here. It's just a non-issue. So again, why are the voters the ones that are facing the burden of reform and not the people at the top who benefit, of course, from the broken electoral system? The evidence that Sir Eric Pickles has produced for the apparent need to tackle voter fraud was thin, to put it very charitably. Um, there was so little evidence, actually, that he was forced to lay out details of individual cases over a 10 year period. And he still managed in that situation to find only a handful of individual instances out of the hundreds of millions of votes that were cast in that period. He actually produced, by my assessment, more convincing evidence of candidate and campaign malpractice, much of it by his own party. But instead of cleaning out that stable, their own stable, the government's chosen to go ahead with a reform that will disenfranchise large numbers of people who are already in the most disadvantaged communities and a significant impact falls upon people from BAME communities. So disenfranchising citizens is an abuse of power. The government doesn't even have the backing of the majority of voters for this kind of action. And we already see, and we need to look at this in this context, 
real evidence of disenfranchisement among black and minority ethnic communities. So introducing new barriers to participation in something so fundamental as that basic right to vote is only going to have a, a negative impact on democratic engagement among these communities. And it's really interesting to see the significant and important efforts at the moment to being made to increase trust and engagement with um, COVID vaccination programmes among members of BME communities. That's vital. So on the one hand, we can see that sensible and positive engagement. But on the other hand, they want us to also accept that we should plough this very different furrow and take steps that we know will create more distance between communities and the political and governmental processes and do that on the basis of no evidence, no grounds and the knowledge that that will disenfranchise people. And I, I would just point out here that this is um, going to affect elections in England, uh, it's proposed to do so, and across the UK. This is not something that will impact upon Scottish elections, and I am glad of that. We would not welcome this direction of travel, um, and we don't welcome it um, in relation to UK elections or uh, those that affect um, England or other places. From my point of view, we should be looking to turn the whole thing on its head. Where is the evidence to support the action that they want to take? doesn't exist, of course. We should really be looking at how best to increase the involvement of people who are not involved in politics, increase the involvement of BAME communities, increase their involvement in democracy as well as just the voting process itself. And I looked for evidence to, to back up what was happening there. One of the things that I did was to have a look at a paper called Assessing the Impact of Individual Electoral Registration Using the British Election Study by the British Election Study Team that doesn't even mention the issue of ethnicity. So we need more research, we need more backup, uh, we need more studies. I was really struck by what Patricia said about this. I think that that was really important. We need to take the bull by the horns and focus on how we tackle this inequality in ways that will result in better, fairer and greater participation that won't suppress voter participation in the way that individual registration and much more so these later latest proposals do. And we need action to make sure that people who are from BAME communities can act, exercise their democratic right to vote without these unnecessary barriers. And also to make sure that we can have progress, which is much needed in increasing political representation at the same time. So I think we have much to do and this direction of travel is wholly unhelpful in making that progress. Thank, Thank you, you, Kirsten. Thank you very much. Um, and I, it looks like there's a, a very good opportunity here for cross-party consensus, uh, with the exception of the Conservatives, obviously. Um, but they, I mean, I think it's entirely possible we could find people from the Conservative Party who could have issue with this. So maybe we could have a, a real cross-party consensus on this issue and with civil society. So um, let's go on to our, our final speaker now, uh, Jeremy Crook, who's the chief executive of the Black Training an enterprise group, which is a group which uh, delivers training for particularly black and ethnic minority young people. Um, so Jeremy, um, obviously this is a group that is gonna be disproportionately affected by these changes, potential changes. Perhaps you can talk us through uh, some of the issues that you think will be coming up. Thanks, thanks Clive. Um, and afternoon everyone. Uh, thank you to Ronnie Mead and the AVPG for this kind invitation. Uh, BTEG is celebrating 30 years as a national organisation uh, this year, and uh, we're very pleased to be involved. Uh, our mission is to end racial inequality, especially in education, employment and the criminal justice system. Uh, we primarily support young people uh, between the age of 10 and 30 years of age, and we also support Black and Asian-led voluntary community organisations to play a full role in the delivery of local services, and in the, in the development of uh, policies uh, locally and nationally. We work with a wide range of organisations across all sectors, uh, including central local government, police, schools, colleges. And we deliver some exciting programmes in schools for young people to encourage them to participate in local activities and decision making. In relation to race and, the, and elections, um, our starting point, we believe, should be how do we increase ethnic minority participation in our democracy? particularly in, in national and local elections. According to the Electoral Commission, there are up to 9 million people who are not registered to vote, uh, which is truly shocking in the oldest democracy uh, in the world. BTEC's view is, the, is that our core value should be uh, to encourage and enable as many people as possible to vote. 
and that should be the starting point. Any hint of voter suppression, we believe, must, must be stamped out. And we think requiring voter ID is not going to enhance participation, as all the speakers have uh, outlined. That is for us just political exclusion. Many young black and minority ethnic people have found their voices since the killing of George Floyd and have called for systemic change and rightly so. We want to see all these young people involved in their democratic institutions, including civil society organizations and to drive change. A key question is, how do you bring about systemic change in our political system? It seems to us the main vehicles are obviously parliament, local councils, public appointments, think tanks, voluntary organizations, online influencers, campaigners, and participating in elections, for example, for police crime commissioners. But we know many young people don't actively get engaged in these areas. At local level, scrutiny of political decisions, decision making and ward level political parties is, is important. Political parties locally should not be opaque and unwelcoming environments. They need to be open and inclusive, especially for young people and people with disabilities. The issues for us in terms of young people and especially those from, from low income backgrounds, is that they do feel disconnected, marginalized and not listened to. And they are put off from engaging with state institutions, for example, like job centers, councils and, poli and police. Our survey of young people recently, which will be published shortly, shows that uh, BAME young people have the following priorities, COVID-19, racial discrimination, the economy and poverty. These are not the same as, as white young people, in particular, racial discrimination. So we know they want to have these issues discussed and addressed and tackled. And we need political parties to be appreciative of that and really embrace that and make sure that they do prioritize issues which young black and Asian people in particular are focused on. In terms of recommendations, we think that political parties do need to review how BAME people are engaged at the local level in their organizations, especially those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds or low income backgrounds to make sure that we have strong working class input from black and Asian communities. I'd like to flag up the fact that there are so few black men involved in local councils as councillors, I think 81 out of 1,026. So there's an issue there. I'm sure there are other groups as well that are underrepresented, but black men seem to be a very tiny proportion of councillors in, in, in England in particular. We also want to, see, want to encourage young people at school and college to value and exercise their right to vote and to get them involved in school debating and developing local action and change projects and get them really involved and, and believe that they can do something. Clearly more young people are stepping up, but we need to make sure that's you know, across all social backgrounds. And I think schools and colleges and universities clearly can do more to kind of get the message across how important it is to exercise their vote. But clearly the government needs to be really focused on tackling systemic racism, and all the issues that young people are now putting on the agenda and of course the environment. So we don't think voter ID is a step in the right direction whatsoever. It's regressive. We need to look at how we get more people actually actively engaged in the political process at all levels. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I really appreciate that, um, that contribution. Um, I think you've made a really important point there, which is that this does feel like the thin end of the wedge and that if this bill isn't challenged, we know the government has a very large majority. If this bill isn't challenged, um, then I think it will in many ways embolden them to go yet further. So this is something I think very important. And you've made some very valid points there. Um, before we go on to the general Q&A, can I bring in uh, our host, Ronnie Mead, and the new chief executive uh, Halima Begum. Halima, Halima, would you like to say a few words on this from a running me perspective to kind of kind of bring this together? I, I would indeed, Clive. Thank you. So and although we're convening, <laughs> oh, can you can you see me? Although we're convening in this space, we're we're also uh, going to be uh, advocating against obviously um, voter ID registration. We always have done, so that's why we also wanted to make sure that our voices were heard as well as convening what is quite an important dialogue for all of us here who have a valuable contribution to make. So the first thing I want to say is that, hear it loud and clear, we'll be opposing this. We will be opposing this as an organisation. And we look forward to cross-party consensus to join us in this opposition. Why are we going to oppose it? Well, frankly, and I think somebody else mentioned it earlier, is this the priority in the middle of the worst pandemic any of us have ever faced? 
both in the UK and also globally, probably isn't. It's really interesting to see of all the different priorities around protecting our communities. This is the one piece of legislation that our government thinks it's a priority. And we're not even given obstacles around, well, we can't do this because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So where we've actually pushed for equalities legislation like the commencement of the socioeconomic duty, the answers we're given are, oh, that's a bit of a tick box exercise. We can't do this. Or another answer is that we can't really report on gender pay gap reporting or ethnicity pay gap reporting because we're in the middle of a crisis. But lo and behold, we're in the middle of a crisis, but we can actually propose a bit of reform on electoral legislation that isn't even evidenced or needed. So I think we should be questioning the motives here. The broader issue is around you know, placing that burden of integrity and proof onto our communities. When we know, for example, that the voters trust in government is quite low. So what we seem to be doing is placing that burden of integrity and uh, trust and confidence back onto the voters. Well, when did that happen? We all know that we're at an all, all time low in terms of voter confidence in politicians. So that seems to be a bit worrying that we're flipping the coin here rather than seeking to build confidence back in our community. So the political system works. We're actually raising fingers to the voters and particular types of voters who are unable to show documentation about their eligibility as a citizen to vote in this country. So I remain very, very worried. But what I did want to talk about, less around the practical um, legislative aspects, because I think there are better experts around the table to talk about that. The broader landscape in which this bill is being proposed is such that uh, black and minority ethnic communities have been disproportionately affected by COVID. Where have we seen the protection for our communities? We haven't seen that. We know that the government's own human rights report showed that 70% of black people just generally don't feel that government has its back. Now we have a proposal to place undue burden on our communities around their integrity to vote. We know this is going to have a disproportionate impact, particularly on Asian voters who are registered but actually are, are going to be uh, you know, turned away if they don't show the right voter ID. We also know that black people are not registered to vote and are underrepresented. So it all feels like over-regulation, more regulation. And, and I think, Josh, you mentioned the concept of fairness. This is what I have a tr problem with. We always hear notions of fairness and meritocracy as though somehow uh, these groups are trying to kind of get, you know, beyond the system and not play fair or not play by the system. When in fact the system isn't fair, is it? So actually the system isn't fair. And by placing undue burdens on undocumented people who live in this country or people, I don't have a driving license by the way, right? So I will struggle to show a photo ID unless I carry my passport about, but I, I hope that we're not required to carry our passports about for ID and regulation. So this is gonna have a terrible impact on trust and confidence in our communities. We are gonna oppose this. Wanted to flag the fact that we will be undertaking some new research alongside the legislative process of this bill because we wanna oppose it. So strong message out there is that this shouldn't be happening. And yes, at a time when, you know, even President Biden in the US is ushering in a post-Trump agenda, and actually looking to liberalize, you know, all of these kind of bureaucratic processes that Trump put in, our uh, leader is actually going back to the Trump agenda. And I say again, why are we playing back to an agenda that was right for America six years ago? Some would say it wasn't right to begin with, when in fact the Americans are saying this is actually out of date. So join us on this campaign that we'll be launching to oppose this bill. Thank you, Halima. Really appreciate that, bringing everything together. Um, we're going to go on to some Q and A, onto the Q and A now, uh, and um, I'm going to ask a question of all the panelists. I'll read it out to you. It's been on for a while on the uh, question and answer panel, uh, but before I go on to the all um, all panelists question, I'm going to ask a very quick question whilst I've got two people here, and that's from Anna Fitzpatrick, and it's um, I've got both Kirsten and Kat here, so maybe we get an answer. They're both the respective front benches of their own political parties. Have the panel, so have you two, seen much interest in cross-party consensus on opposing this legislation and, and perhaps even campaigning? Is that something either of you have discussed or something you could discuss and there perhaps could be a consensus between Labour and the SNP and thus bring in other people as well? Kirsten. Kirsten. <laughs> Kirsten. If we can you. agree, he speaks first. 
Right, you go first, Kat, and I'll come in after. I think it's better to say, Kirsten and I, uh, we have talked about this uh, offline, and uh, uh, I know that I speak quite often to Owen Thompson, who's uh, one of Kirsten's SNP colleagues who speaks on the, who sits on the Speaker's Committee uh, on the Electoral Commission, so I talk to Owen quite a lot about uh, these kind of issues as well, and I don't think there is um, any difference between the approach from the Labour Party and the approach from the SNP, but I obviously can't speak for, for the SNP, <laughs> so I'll let Kirsten do that. <laughs> obviously, we always welcome people uh, coming on board, Kat, but no, I'm, uh, in all seriousness, it's a, you know, it, it's a really challenging issue, I think, so the, the more that we can find uh, space to talk about this and to uh, try and, and push back against it, um, uh, you know, the, the better, I think. Obviously, as Kat said, uh, my colleague um, Owen Thompson probably has a lot of the uh, the responsibility for that because of his role. My role is more from the perspective of equalities. But, you know, I think that on this and on so many things, I'm, I'm sure that Kat will find this in, in her uh, parliamentary colleague team as well. We, we tend to just work on it together. And this is one of these issues that I think there will be significant interest in. I think that it, it's really troubling. And, and you know, the, the more that we can try and come together and put our heads together on it, the, the better. I think that'll be really important. And, and obviously with the parliamentary arithmetic five, you know, the Tories have got a huge majority. If opposition parties aren't working together on this, we will absolutely be battered. Um, if, you know, if we're going to win any concessions, it's through cross-party cooperation. That's certainly the approach that I've taken uh, in this role with, um, you know, not just Kirsten's colleagues, but, you know, colleagues from, from Ply Cymru and the Liberal Democrats as well. And, you know, I think we're all very much on the same page. Brilliant. It'd be really good for us to, inside Parliament as well, to reach out to those uh, other groups, civic society as well, to kind of really make our, our voices heard on this, uh, because I think it's a, a critical one. Um, I've got a question for all of you. Kat, you've already answered. You've done your homework. You Feel free to sit this one out if you want. Your question's there for everyone to see. Your answer, sorry, is there for everyone to see. Uh, it's a question from Liz Morse, and it's all the panellists. So I'll start with... Um, I'll start with Morris first and then I'll, I'll move around. But the question, if you haven't already read it, is uh, we need to ensure citizenship and democracy education begins at school uh, and is taken seriously. So it's a subject which teaches about democracy and equality. At present, only state maintained schools are required to teach citizenship as part of the national curriculum. Academies and free schools can do it if they want to. In other words, it's optional. So will the panel support making citizenship a mandatory entitlement for every child in every school type and investing in teacher training to ensure there is a trained citizenship teacher in every school? Now, clearly, if you're not a politician, then you can't give that guarantee, but you can talk around the subject. You may think it's something which is critical uh, for the longer term the longer term issues around our democracy and deepening our democracy and enhancing our democracy. So, um, Morris, would you like to have a stab at that first? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, um, political education is is very important. I, I, I absolutely think that that learning how our society works and how you engage in it and what the levers of power are and, and, and how you can have an influence on that is, is something that certainly miss, it was certainly missing from my education. But then maybe that's because I'm old. It was it certainly wasn't it wasn't even part of our thinking, you know, how 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 would you change things? How? If you see something that you don't like, what do you do about that? Nothing, nothing along those lines was uh, was was part of what what I was uh, educated for. I was prepared to be plugged into into the into the work uh, market, and, and and I do think I do think that that's it's not just a nice thing to have. It's not it's not just a nice extra subject. It it's really intrinsic to how we how we how we exist in in this society. So 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 I I'd, I'd be all for all for that. I mean, I, I mean, I, th there's a bit of me that 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 balks at the citizenship thing because that that could be used as a way of excluding people who aren't citizens. There's a there is a there is a there's a there's a narrative gap there that we that we need to be careful of. But but um, it, the the basic concept of 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 teaching people how to how to engage in a society they're going to live in, yeah, that, that's a no-brainer. So I guess it's, it's it's more about being critically aware and, and being able to um, being able to take part in a democracy, being able to function in democracy, rather than just being a kind of passive consumer, which you kind of get the impression, I think, from in, from how um, some curriculums are, are being constructed, that this is more where the government would like people to go. Maybe I'm being cynical, but that 
that would be my my take on the issue. Um, uh, Patricia, would you like? Do you have a yeah. view on this? Yeah, um, I would support absolutely having more information um, on the curriculum about politics and democracy. I actually share Morris's concerns around citizenship, just the framing of it, because it is slightly problematic. You wouldn't want to see it hijacked, yes. I don't know, by like <laughs> a Britain first kind of, I don't know if that would happen. But anyway, yeah, just those concerns are shared. Um, yeah, absolutely. Political literacy is so important. And we have been working a wee bit with uh, Shadow UK because they have set up their APPG. They are looking to get politics on the curriculum. We're actually currently running our own political literacy training program ourselves at the moment. And it's looking at things like how to challenge, you know, racism, politics, how to write your, how to kind of just engage, you know. I agree, GRT people feel like politics is something that happens to them, it's not for them. So this kind of stuff is so important, especially at school, because you're a captive audience at school. And it is good about creating critical awareness and engagement and just about, yeah, the real, how important democracy is and it is possible to shape your future, you know. So, so yes. Uh, Josiah. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's absolutely central. I think it also links into the, the need for, you know, a fairer franchise overall as well. You know, we've seen both the 16 rolled out in Scotland, now Wales as well. Um, in Scotland, they have, a, I think, modern studies that everyone has to, to study. So, you know, slightly more developed in terms of political literacy um, on the curriculum there. Um, but yeah, I think it's absolutely key. And I think, you know, the government has shown that um, it is willing to sort of make these kind of changes. Um, we've got the overseas electoral bill as well coming down the line soon, which wants to extend the franchise to everyone who's been living outside the UK for more than 15 years. And I think they'll be pumping millions of pounds into sort of promoting registration among these groups. So why can't we have the same efforts in, in schools, you know, getting 16 and 17 year olds registered to vote, um, you know, while they're in schools and having these conversations and political debates that, that really raise the level of political debate for, for everyone. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it should definitely be, be up there in terms of our priorities. Um, thank you very much Jeremy obviously you're working with young people I mean you'll see them when they're coming out of formal education full-time education in many instances what's your take on this are they prepared for engaging in a in a complex highly complex democratic society I don't think many are and I agree with the other speakers we need to you know make sure it is mandatory and even question what does citizenship mean uh, who does it include who does it exclude and have that conversation uh, we know that young people like to have discussions now and they, they get really engaged and they've got a lot to say. Uh, they say a lot more than I would say when I was, you know, 13, 14, they're, they're just a lot more tuned in. And obviously social media and technology has made them uh, give, get access to information and ideas and views that many of us didn't get when we were younger. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. I think it's really important. It needs to be creative. It needs to involve external organizations and practitioners and creative people and make it enjoyable, you know, and that they are prepared when they leave school to participate actively in their communities. Uh, they understand what they need to do to, you know, win employment and, and be successful and, and give back, you know, all, all those things are really important. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Kirsten, I'm sure you're going to tell us now how brilliantly you do it in Scotland. So uh, please work away. <laughs> I'll, I'll, do my, I'll do my best. I mean, in, in most business, I think that, you know, the, there is definitely a different direction of travel. Um, if you think about the, the franchise itself in Scotland, the franchise for uh, our elections is wider, it's broader, it's just a, a more inclusive uh, way of approaching this, which I think is really important. Um, but maybe sort of looking at, you know, the specific education issue, I um, have worked um, in further education, so I'm aware of how very embedded this kind of issue is in colleges, which I think is, is really vital considering the, uh, you know, the overwhelming age range of the, the people that are, are within our FE uh, colleges. But I've also got a bit of background as a mum of two teenagers in secondary school. So uh, I can see what's really happening, not just what we, we read in the papers is happening. And I'm really encouraged by that. Uh, there's a, a curriculum for excellence in Scotland, which covers um, young people from when they're, they're very small um, in, in nursery education right until they, they leave secondary school and part of that in our secondary school class uh, uh, year groups is that people have a subject and I wish I could remember the name of the subject at the moment but it includes things like politics, democracy, society, community. These are compulsory things that our young people have to cover um, and I know from my own experience that that, that is the reality. Um, I think it, it, it's really important that that is inclusive. I think that it can't just be citizenship in some narrowly defined way. It's about the contributions that people 
make and their engagement with the society around them. Um, I know that I speak to young people in schools a lot. I am sure I am not any different to any other MP um, and I get a good grilling from these young people, whether they're primary or secondary school pupils. They know that it's my job to work for them. And I think the final thing I would say on this um, is Patricia mentioned um, about politics being for you as a message that she wanted to put out there. And I think that we have made real progress in Scotland. I know when I was a young person myself, I was very aware that politics was not for people like me. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that there are significantly fewer young people in Scotland now who would have that perspective. And that's going to really matter as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, Kat, I'm going to bring you in very quickly. I'm going to take the question on because you have answered it. You've, you've explained about Labour front bench policy for anyone that wants to see it. I guess you can speak with Maybe you could just take your front bench hat off if you wanted to um, very quickly. I know you're not allowed to do that. Oh, you, you, kind of, you, 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 you sleep in it. Everyone has, you have to sleep in your front bench hat. I know everyone does. Um, but uh, I, I mean, ultimately, is there an element here rather than simply just uh, confining this, what it, this, this citizenship or this kind of democratic engagement component within a module or within a certain part? Is this something that needs to be woven through our education system, the ability of critical faculty to ask questions, to be able to engage in a democratic process? Because democracy isn't just about ticking a box or crossing a box. It's also about how we ask questions, how we look at the world, how we ask questions of our representatives. And that's something I think needs to perhaps be imbued throughout our education process, perhaps. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And Clive, it's about who holds power and how you get rid of them. And really, that's fundamentally what it, it comes down to. And I thought Kirsten spoke really well about, it. I think, called social studies, I think. In, is that right? Um, it, no, it's not that. Uh, anyway, I don't, what do I know about this Scottish education system? Um, <laughs> uh, as a Cumbrian. Um, you know what? Like, um, I just think that it's about empowering our young people through school. So um, I'm a huge advocate of extending the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds. However, I always said that has to go alongside a comprehensive, compulsory um, social studies, citizenship uh, type education, whereby we teach all our young people about how power works, who holds it, who controls what. Um, and I think increasingly when that's, that's quite complicated um, in you know, different parts, the component parts of, of uh, the United Kingdom, but also it's complicated even within an English context, whereby obviously some areas have evolution and other areas uh, don't, and you have multiple different layers of, of councils. Now, no wonder people are confused. Um, if you don't understand how the system works, how can you be empowered to grasp it with both hands, to participate in it, to stand for election? I'm not just interested, by the way, in, in young people from all backgrounds being able to vote at elections. I'm actually interested in them being political leaders as well. There is absolutely no reason why, for instance, the House of Commons shouldn't have an 18 year old elected to sit in it. Now, if there were 650 18 year olds, uh, that'd be a dreadful way of, of making policy, but it would be equally as dreadful if we elected 650 80 year olds to make policy. Our parliament should be representative of the country that we seek to represent. And that means making sure that we are throwing the doors of our democracy open and welcoming people in. And that has to come with knowledge. And if we do not have a decent system of educating our young people in schools about how the world they live in works, then we have absolutely no chance whatsoever. So yes, extending the franchise, but absolutely with decent education around that. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, uh, Josiah said uh, he thinks it's modern studies, it's called. So it's not, oh, the person is saying no. Have, oh, it's a mystery. Study. Modern it's studies. A... No, there's, um, it, is, it is something that's um, throughout the curriculum, you know, the, that whole curriculum for excellence, you know, yeah. permeates everything, but there is also a separate subject, and I'm afraid I have absolutely no recollection of what it is, even though I have two children who are probably studying it right now. <laughs> They'll tell you tonight, and you can let us know. Um, thank you. Uh, before we go on to the next question, um, just to say that there's a point being made here by someone called Nicola Luke, which is that UK Parliament has an in-house team who deliver teacher training and visit schools and community groups, particularly targeting those less likely to engage. And they've left a link where if you're interested, for example, Jeremy or anyone else on this uh, in this meeting can, can, can connect onto and book in. So that's something that's extremely useful. OK, I'm going to move on now to um, a, a colleague, um, Kim. Uh, Kim, are you there? As a fellow member of parliament, she should be getting unmuted now. Kim Johnson. Kim, can you 
Can you hear us? Yeah, I am unmuted. here. Can you Would you like me? to ask? I can, we can hear you loud and clear coming in loud from Liverpool, I believe. Would you like to ask your question, Kim? Yeah, my, my question was to Jeremy because Jeremy um, raised some really um, important questions that resonate, you know, particularly to Liverpool, you know, underrepresentation across the board in civic le uh, leadership and politics is a main issue. So I just wanted to ask Jeremy what he thought that we as politicians can do to improve those situations in our own constituencies. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, I haven't been to Liverpool for quite a while, but we did some a lot of work in the 90s in Liverpool with the uh, black communities there. And mm -hmm. I was very shocked to hear about the overt racism in Liverpool. I come from Warsaw, it was pretty bad there, but going to Liverpool was a, a real eye opener. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that We've, we've generally got to kind of tackle, haven't we, the kind of institutional uh, bias and institutional racism within, within all, all, all organisations and political parties and at local government level and make sure that there's genuine action to actually transform organisations and the way that the culture of these organisations and their, whether it's conscious or unconscious, they need to improve and change. And that can only be done by, you know, proper engagement with black communities, listening to what they say, taking action, and looking at the data to see things actually improve and that black people, especially in places like Liverpool, are in proper positions where they can influence things and we can have an inclusive organisations and, and, and inclusive communities. It's There's still a lot of, you know, uh, ignorance out there. There's a lot of lack of interest and we've just got to keep challenging and make sure we identify the allies uh, and work with our allies to uh, bring about real transformational change. But we've got to kind of, I think, start with young people because you know there are generations which do not want to change for whatever reason and maybe we've got to look to the future and, and the present in terms of you know the next generation to really bring about transformational change especially in Liverpool I think people would be shocked just to, to look at the data in a place like Liverpool in terms of employment and housing still it's it's very stark and that doesn't mean you know ignoring uh, poor white working class communities obviously it's about working together but we cannot carry on ignoring racial inequalities in our towns and cities and institutions. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jeremy. Thank you, Kim, for the question as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask um, a question that's come in from Salah, Salah Mohammed, and it's, um, it's a challenging question, but I think it's one that needs to be asked. I'm going to ask it of uh, Halima Jeremy. Maurice has attempted an answer. You can come back in, and Patricia. And it's this. I think one of the problems is the weak or non-existent connection between local politicians and councillors and the weak capacity of black and ethnic minority groups. Um, Patricia, would you, would, you, would you like to comment on that? So can you repeat it? So the weak yeah, connection- Yeah, I will, I, I will. You. So I think one of the problems that we, that we face is the weak and non-existent connection between local politicians and councillors and the weak capacity of mm. black and ethnic minority groups. Um, so it's kind of a challenge to you, to organizations, um, to our community, but also politicians as well. So you can come in from any angle on that, but. So it, weak it, it, capacity yeah. of minority ethnic. I'd kind of I'd kind of challenge that and push it back and say actually even when we've had kind of groups come together and push back on local councils not serving them well, there's still been really poor engagement. I don't I don't agree with that completely at all. I, I know some people are very disenfranchised, very, have a lot of apathy, but even I know sometimes I know from the past that some people have had to like do direct action to get their voices heard, you know, and stuff like that. So actually there's 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 push and pull there, and there's there's good councils and there's good and bad councils. But I think, no, it, it's kind of on both sides. It does come down on both sides to actually engage and to have proper consultation. That just doesn't yeah. seem to happen, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I'd push back a little bit on that. Good, good. Maurice, you, you answered the question you uh, on there, but you might want to say something as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, the answer that I gave on there was more, as, well, I was more talking about representation. So, so definitely, as as Jeremy said, on a, on a local councillor level, there's, uh, it's 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 just not uh, an area that um, that many black people have gone into. The, the number of councillors, uh, um, um, local councillors, I, I'm in Wandsworth, and I think we've got you know, there's two out of sixty in an area that's that's pretty diverse. Now, what what that means, and that was, it's not just about sort of faces and places. What that means is that when conversations are happening in a room that impact community, there's no there's no one there who has that lived experience. There's no connection to, to 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 the issue that's at, that's at hand and you know we can all sit in a room and focus group and think oh this this group of people might want that or this this type of person might want this if we've not if there's no one in the room to go oh actually yeah the reality of life is this 
then there's no one that brings you back. So, so, so that gap between what's happening politically on a, a, on a local level and what's happening with communities gets bigger and bigger because there is no, there's no one speaking up for those communities in, 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 uh, on, on a local level. I, I thought that's more the point we were talking about. And I, I think that follows into all areas, as, as has been said, all areas of, of engagement, not just councillors. It's who's running the local charities. It's who's um, who's the governors on the school boards. It's who's who, who are the business leaders or whatever in, in, in whatever area. All, in all of those areas, there's a bleaching effect that that means that if you're from a minority community you don't see you don't see anyone who's lived your experiences anywhere in the structures that, that, mm. that you look to for change uh, thank you Maurice I'm gonna uh, Halima before I, I come to you I'm gonna ask you I'm just gonna take it on a little bit further I mean it does simply having more black representatives with that lived experience necessarily equate to better representation you may think it does I, I would make the point of the Labour Party obviously has had some ongoing issues with representation uh, and we have around about 40 or so black and minority ethnic um, members of parliament. So I guess the question is, do you, once you become a, a black councillor or black MP, do you become part of a kind of almost separate class, if you want, a political class, whereby, you know, therefore the kind of the structural racism that's in our society um, basically gets bedded in and you become you become a part of it in, in many ways. Well, I think with, with all leadership, I mean, there's a, there's a challenge there to make sure that the, the higher you climb the kind of corridors of power, that you, you remain connected to the grassroots communities that you represent. And that becomes harder and harder for any leader. So you have to then build in systems that check the loop feedback into your communities. If you don't do that, it's actually very easy to become removed. I'd say, Clive, you, you represent a constituency that doesn't particularly feel uh, black led to me, but you are representing a wider constituency. You remain quite connected to your local constituency, but the national constituency space that you represent. So it is possible. I don't think we should only look at black politicians to be representing black led constituencies. Fundamentally, you know, a perfect outcome should be that a black MP represents a majority white constituency. But the worst scenario is if you've got a predominantly black led constituency, that's then led by a person that isn't black. Now I tell you why that's problematic. If you look at the principles of democracy to be represented by a peer, if you no longer look like the peer or you, you don't represent your peers, who are you representing? So I think the problem then becomes um, relevant for inner city areas that are then being represented by leaders that don't look like themselves. Um, and also, as Maurice was saying, it's not just about politics. I mean, look at charities. Look at what charities so white have to say. I mean, they're saying that the charities are led by people who are not black. I've just heard, heard from Jeremy. Um, not only that, I mean, if you look at black representation or Asian representation, they tend to be female. Well, what happened to the black men? I mean, did they just suddenly disappear and check out of politics? Probably not. But there's something there that isn't working. So I think we need to work harder at getting to be uh, much more inclusive. I would also, I think um, that question to me was a little bit unsettling as well, because I have a real problem with people saying lack of capacity in BME communities means that they're not able to engage, etc. 30 years ago, um, if you went to Tower Hamlets, where, where I'm from, I used to hear that about my parents. And I thought, hmm, maybe because they speak English with a different accent, possibly that's seen as a comment around their capacity. 30 years later, the children have grown up. They've gone to elite universities. They still don't get represented in the right forums. So the charities in Tower Hamlets, we have the best of the charities, by the way, in Tower Hamlets, but they're led by white middle-class leaders. In a, in, a, in a demographic that's mostly Bangladeshi and Somali, that's where the challenge lies, I think. So if you want to get to a perfect situation, we want to see Clive, someone like you, leading in a majority white constituency. But the worst outcome we want to avoid is being led by somebody who isn't representative of your demographics in an area that's predominantly black or working class and so on. Thank you, Halima. Uh, I'm just going to bring very finally, because we're coming up to time, Jeremy, to, if you want to come back in, Jeremy, on that. On that particular question uh, and and then and then we'll wrap up um, and thank you for all the questions that have come in because they've been fantastic so we haven't got to you as well so jeremy the last word well just i think i think local engagement between you know local politicians and, and, and black and asian communities is really important but you've got to resource the voice and coordination work to make sure that you know there's a, there's a, a coordination there and, and a platform 
that there are hundreds, if not thousands of black and Asian groups all over the country. You know, you, you've got to make sure they're supported and that we can have a, a coherent set of priorities communicated at local level. That does happen, but it could be a lot, lot better with better resourcing uh, of those organizations. So they've got a strong voice. Thank you, Jeremy. A coherent set of priorities uh, is what I picked out uh, very uh, distinctly there from Jeremy, which I think kind of sums up what we need in the coming weeks and months as this legislation looms. It feels to me that this is a, a fight that, if we, if, that we could not only win potentially, but it's one that I think we have to have uh, with the government, given that I think that if they do get, a, if they do get away with this, and I will use uh, that term, uh, then I think it will potentially be the thin end of the wedge for yet further gerrymandering of the political system, one which I think is already deeply flawed and unequal as it is. So this is something I think you'll be hearing more about. I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, for their contributions today. If you'd like to find out more information about this issue um, and the work of uh, the APPG, then please go to the Runnymede uh, website where I'm sure they will have this prominently featured on their page in the coming uh, minutes and hours. And, and you can also find some of the statistics and links that have been featured today. Uh, but otherwise, I wish you all uh, a good uh, day and thank you very much for joining us and being part of this conversation. It won't be the last time that you hear about this issue and this legislation and the, uh, I think the fight back, I'm gonna use that term fight back, uh, the fight back on this legislation, which I think is critical. So thank everyone, thank you everyone for being part of today's conversation uh, and see you at the next APPG uh, in I think a couple of months time. Um, so thank you, take care, bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you very much.